Hey everybody, today we're going to be talking more about Alain de Baton's esteemed YouTube channel, School of Life. You all seem to like it enough the first time I did it. I desperately wanted to talk about this channel more, uh, so here we are, doing another little video where we vibe about School of Life. Uh, and with that, let's get into it. The first video I want to talk about today is a really weird one called Bad Taste. The major thesis of this video is that we shouldn't judge people, morally or otherwise, just for having bad taste. Because the only reason they have bad taste to begin with is that they have been harmed in some way. Someone traumatized or starved for beauty might develop gauche or excessive taste as a result. What's bad in bad taste isn't the person, but the prior trauma which they're seeking to compensate for through their decor. There's no point in mocking or offering lectures about art history. The problem isn't a lack of information, it's a trauma created by a badly broken and unbalanced world. So personally, I find this video hilarious because it seems to only exist in response to Alain de Baton's own weird snobbery and obsession with people agreeing with him about what good art looks like. You know, when I see a person who's wearing something I don't like, or when I see a house that I think is bad, Sure, I might make a mental note of it. In some cases, I might find it a bit funny. Ha-ha, I might say, internally. But personally, I never feel like there's a problem that needs solving there. Like this person's bad house needs to be explained to them so that they can change their ways. But seemingly, every time Alan sees some art he doesn't like, he feels this inward urge to absolutely destroy the person who does like it, just wreck them with facts and logic until they know what true art looks like. An urge that can only be stifled by the realization, no, Alan, it, it, it's not their fault. You shouldn't get mad at them or try to change them. You should feel pity for them. There's no point in mocking or offering lectures about art history. The problem isn't a lack of information. It's a trauma. And this realization is extremely sad to me, particularly because it's just not true, is it? Just because somebody has taste that Alain de Baton thinks is bad, uh, that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them. It's an absolutely preposterous claim on the face of it, you know? Some people just like things that you don't like. So, for example, the Russians and the Saudis have over the years developed a reputation for spectacularly bad, as in gaudy and over-the-top taste. This isn't, in a sense, surprising. A century of extreme deprivation under communism and an eternity of eking out a living in the barren deserts of Saudi Arabia have created understandably desperate desires for compensation. No, Alan, you can't diagnose all of Russia and Saudi Arabia with some kind of traumatic art deficiency and then use that to explain why you hate their stuff so much. That's a classic, really weird thing to do, in my opinion. Just, just if, if you did that and you were around me, I'd put that on a board that says weird shit that you, weird fucking, fucking sociopathic weird shit. That's what I'd call it if, if, if you were around me and said that. You know, this video may seem really odd, and surely that part about rudely claiming that entire other cultures have bad art wouldn't land well on most people. But what's interesting to me is that, well, this video is just kind of a natural and logical consequence of thinking that taste in art can be objectively measured for its quality. See, if you think you are objectively correct about what good art looks like, then at some point you're gonna need to provide some account for how it is that so many people seem to disagree with you constantly, all the time. And this explanation by way of art trauma is basically as good as you're gonna get. It's either that or you just say that people with bad taste in art are stupid or evil, I guess. And while this explanation is ridiculous and makes no sense, it at least allows Alain de Baton to do two things. First, construct a fictional narrative wherein he is the divine arbiter of good taste. Second, make him look like something other than an elitist asshole for saying that first thing. 
Okay, uh, the next video I want to talk about is one called How to Make a Country Rich. So roughly, this video is about describing the cultural conditions that would lead to the most wealthy society possible. And honestly, it's one of the most woke things I've ever seen from School of Life. Throughout the video, Alon describes an increasingly awful culture, one filled with miserable people who constantly define themselves through what they can buy and what position they have. In Richland, everyone is encouraged from a young age to imagine that they might one day, perhaps by around 33, be the richest person in the country. Dreams of successful entrepreneurship abound, but by middle age, most people in rich land have, by definition, failed to measure up to the exalted hopes once placed in them. They keep their regrets hidden, however, and are quietly prescribed tranquilizers and antidepressants. They feel constant shame over their lack of accomplishments. They're anxious all the time. They can't sleep. The most profitable country in the world would even have terrible weather all the time. The point is obvious, right? That we shouldn't take living in the most profitable society as an unquestioned good. There are other things to be concerned with, namely being happy. To this end, I agree with the video completely and even think it's pretty good. That said, I take a sort of subtle issue here, specifically with the fact that it assumes that peak productivity is a function of psychological torment, that the wealth of a society is in a direct causal relationship with how much people suffer. This is not a well-evidenced claim. Actually, while I'm no expert on the psychology of productivity, the opposite seems to be more true. While certain amounts of stress might be able to motivate you, the kind of mind-numbing anxiety associated with insomnia is not going to make you terribly industrious, and that's for obvious reasons. Feeling depressed and feeling like a failure constantly aren't great motivators. And I mean hell, giving people more leisure time has been shown in a few cases to increase productivity. And in the end, while I don't think what they're doing here is toxic exactly, I do think it's seeding too much ground. See, people like the idea that the world they're living in is gonna get better. Many people, myself included, want to live in an innovative and industrious society, one where we find solutions to various problems, one where we produce the things that people want and need. And to tell those people, in essence, that the process of making society more equitable, giving workers more rights, more power, more opportunity to feel content, is also the process that would take away our innovation to some extent, well, it's making that more equitable society look less appealing than we need to. We can see this problem crop up again in another video from School of Life called Capitalism v. Socialism or something like that. This video is a joke, basically. Uh, they take two cupcake stands and design one to be under socialist ideology and another one to be under capitalist ideology. And leaving aside that the video shows a strange lack of understanding for what socialism or capitalism is, it also betrays the same idea. Anwar's cake stall is governed by key socialist principles. Because profit seems to rest on exploitation, the only goal is to break even, prioritizing the needs of the workers over those of consumers, providing customers with only the basics. The capitalist cupcake has sprinkles, it's fun. The socialist cupcake is bare and dumb and utilitarian. This is how we are instructed to understand any leftist impulse in these two videos. Something that we might want to do or have to do, but which nonetheless inevitably will give us boring cupcakes and a culture of austerity. And I don't know, I don't think that's entirely fair. Moving on, this time to a video I find less complicated, uh, and more gross. It's a video called A Book Nobody Should Read Their Children. Uh, so basically, this video is trying to make a really simple point. That life is a whole lot sadder than we lead kids to believe. 
that we give them expectations that the real world can never really stack up against. The whole thing is like an ironic picture book. It's about a bunny whose life is really bad and then he dies. And then the video tells us that his life was fundamentally normal. You know, I can't 100% disagree with this video's hot take. Maybe it's true that we give kids inflated expectations. The average person probably does experience a lot of sadness in their lives, and at the very least, it is interesting that a lot of us are afraid to let kids in on this information. At the same time for me, uh, this video embodies what I find so toxic and destructive about School of Life. Like, the life that this bunny leads, it isn't just normal sad, it's pretty much dog shit the entire time. He has a miserable marriage that he only got into because he hated her slightly less than his own crippling loneliness. He feels totally isolated in life, like he can't share his emotional world with anyone. He feels like he helps no one and does nothing of value. And is this all really true? Is this just the average life? Well, I don't think so. To me, what it really looks like is basically the inner dialogue of someone with depression describing why their life is meaningless, why there is nothing worthwhile to living, nothing joyful, nothing that should be preserved. To be clear, I don't say all that lightly or as a joke. I use such intense language there because to me, that's what's so disturbing about this video. If I were extremely depressed in watching this piece, I might think that School of Life is genius, helpful, emotionally resonant, because it would reflect back at me my emotional experience, my understanding of the world. And to some extent, that's good in a way. It's good to remind people that they're not alone in their sadness. But at the same time, it takes from that the most hopeless, painful, unproductive message imaginable and just leaves us there that it is normal, that it should be expected to live a life defined by pain and despair and little else, that it is your destiny simply by virtue of being a person. I said in my last video that School of Life reminded me of incel shit, and some people were confused by that. But well, this is the black pill. At its core, its only real point is that life is extremely bad and that we must accept this fact as quickly as possible. And they sell it to us. That's a nice segue to the next video we're going to talk about called Why You Should Read Self-Help Books. The basic case made by this video is that the reason why self-help books are disliked by so many people and not seen as serious literature is that we condescendingly believe that gaining better mental health is something you should have already done, that this aim is not worthy of further investigation. This concerted attack on the entire genre of self-help is a symptom of a romantic prejudice against the idea of emotional education. Offering explicit emotional education is regarded as beneath the dignity of any serious writer. So I'll say two things as a disclaimer here. First, there might be some truth to this. There might legitimately be people out there who, consciously or subconsciously, reject the genre simply because they find the idea of self-betterment beneath them in some way. I don't know. Second, I'm not about to provide some categorical dismissal of self-help books. It's not my place to direct people on what you should or shouldn't read. And if you've gotten value out of one of these books, all power to you. All that said, um, this video is ridiculous. And it's ridiculous because it is reducing the scope of criticisms we might have for self-help to a surreal extent. When I go online and look up problems people have with this genre, what I find are two major criticisms. 
First, and most commonly, they're dubious of its efficacy, unsure if it accomplishes anything, helps people get better in any way. Second, they're concerned that many of the people working in this field aren't qualified in the least. Self-help is a multi-billion dollar industry. There's an enormous market to exploit in people who want to read books to improve themselves, and so it attracts people who want to write those books and make that money. Qualification and experience aren't gatekeepers here. These, to me, seem like important things to think about. Even if you're convinced that self-help is great, they represent the argument that you'd have to tackle to make your case. What Alain de Baton brings up, on the other hand, is an imaginative flight of fancy. Maybe this is the problem that people have. They hate people trying to get better and investing in themselves. They think it's frivolous. This is a point that is easily dismantled and shunned. So I guess we have to ask, why would School of Life possibly want to straw man the opposition to self-help in their video about it? And you know what? You've lost me there. I can't imagine what sort of agenda they might have. Why could they possibly want to deceive us about this? It's unthinkable. It's... Ugh. <laughs> Let's move on to a related School of Life thing. This time, just a community post they made on YouTube called How to Read Fewer Books. The basic idea of this post is that we shouldn't measure ourselves based on how many books we've read, and that altogether we care about reading lots of books too much, and should instead be focusing on the books that will make us happier. So uh, while I guess this one sounds uncontroversial enough, it is very, very funny for two reasons. First, it just feels like another ridiculously self-serving narrative from School of Life, and let me quote this post real quick. I'm gonna ch I'm gonna do my absolute fucking best Alain de Baton accent, and if a single one of you say that it's not good, I'm gonna block you from commenting on my channel forever. So here we go. Once we know that we are reading to be content, we don't need to chase every book published this season. So for example, we will need a few key books that explain our psyches to us, that teach us about how families work and how they might work better, that take us through how to find a job we can love and how we can develop the courage to develop our opportunities. Wow, says School of Life. Seems like you got too many books on your hands that you're worried about. Well, you don't even need to worry about all those stupid books. Instead, read about these topics, the ones that we just so happen to have books about that we can sell you. The problem you're having is that you should be reading different books. Like for instance, the ones we write, the ones that we... <laughs> The ones that we write, those should be your top priority books. The other funny thing about this post is that, like, who could Alain de Baton possibly be speaking to? Who is he talking about? Like, is this a pressing concern in School of Life's world that everyone's just reading too much and is too obsessed with getting all the books into their minds? I don't know a person who's so anxious about reading all the books that I'd feel the need to tell them, hey, take a reading break. You don't gotta read it all, bookworm. It really just goes to show how much of a fart contest uh, this channel is. Moving on to one last video called What We Should Eat on a Date. I saved this one for last because it's just so odd uh, that even now I really don't understand what's going on here. Like, right off the bat, it makes it really clear that it's some sort of guide on what to order on a first date to impress your desired partner. Which, uh, that's pretty weird, right? It has a huge pickup artist you should make weird, unnatural choices if you want to seduce someone else vibes. How we order on a date can, in a minor key, belong to the task of winning someone else over to our cause. So let's think of a number of ways of ordering food and drink that suggest intriguing and complex things about our identities. But honestly, I have trouble even going down this road of looking at what the video's about 
because the entire thing is just so goddamn stupid. Like, here's some of their suggested food orders. Let's watch them together. Fish fingers off the children's menu. Through our order, we'd be implying that we could recognize, without anxiety, the claim of the more childish parts of our personalities. The order might work best if we combined it with an obviously sophisticated starter or dessert, cranberry juice. The deep red drink would be a symbol of independence. We'd be making a rather unconventional order through it, this not being what people typically ask for in a restaurant. We'd just be quietly asserting that we didn't mind appearing a little odd for the sake of getting something we genuinely liked. Hello, waiter. I'd like the children's fish sticks. And as a beverage, I'd like to order the cranberry juice in order to seduce my lovely date. Since I'm sitting here with my lovely date, I'd like to have the fish sticks off the kids menu with a nice glass of cranberry juice on the side. And for dessert, mm, perhaps the most elegant thing you have on the menu. Mm. Watching this stuff, it just feels like, how is anybody even supposed to take this seriously as advice? How could this possibly be constructed as helpful by anybody under any circumstances? It just feels like a BuzzFeed quiz recited to us here by an annoying British man. I don't understand it, and I don't understand how it's real. Uh, so that's all the videos from School of Life that I wanted to talk about today. I'll be honest, these were just the videos that I wanted to talk about before, uh, but decided that it would be a waste of time, but now I'm, I talked about them. Uh, I don't have a conclusion to this video of any kind. I think many, many School of Life videos are extremely bad. Uh, some of them are fine, but a lot of them are bad. And that's what uh, this video is about. So that's it. Uh, I hope you liked the video, everybody. And if you did, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, give me money on Patreon if you want to. I'd obviously appreciate it. We do little streams there sometimes. Could be cool for, could be, could be cool for you. Uh, and now it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Spencer Yost Wolf asks, do you think you'll end up pursuing media studies as a professor down the road? Uh, I mean, maybe if YouTube dries up. Like, personally, I feel like I have a, a very, very cool job when it comes to media studies sorts of things. But we can all, we can all see the writing on the wall, right? Uh, the, the, the big Joel arc is going to come to an end. And on that day, yeah, I'm going to get a PhD in media studies and be the most important uh, professor in the world. Okay, bye.